Okay, so you're trying to find minutes from the Yeah. Okay. Okay, so our first speaker in this session is Fernando Greenstein from Los Angeles Lab. He'll be talking about full screen simulation of turbulent material mixing. So. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so get used to the setup. We need to move the mic somewhere. No. Up, up or down? Down, probably. Is that better? Yeah. Okay, so basically, uh, the two things I want to be focusing on is consequences of under resolution, which is the typical problem we have to deal, for example, at the national labs for very complex systems. So we're interested in under-resolved material mixing driven by under-resolved velocity fields and the more complicated problem when we try to compound both under-resolution of velocities with under-resolved initial conditions. So um, basically the, the plan that we have here is to focus a little bit first on what are the basic issues of models and observations, uh, what are the basic issues of coarse grain simulation, which is essentially LES and IELTS, and uh, I'm going to be concentrating the discussion on two areas. Uh, the problem of scalar mixing and isotropic turbulence as a very basic problem in which to address the issue of under-resolved mixing by, driven by under-resolved velocities, and then uh, I'm going to look at shock-driven turbulence mixing, and I'm going to try to look at um, the challenges on the modeling, which come out as consequences of the basic difficulties that we have to address. So one here that I'm going to be looking at is a challenge to the basic mix uh, modeling that we normally have to deal with, and we try to keep as simple as possible. And then the other problem is related to initial conditions, which is the issue of how initial conditions end up affecting uh, what could be late time predictability uh, uh, issues for, um, for actual science problems. So a um, quick reminder of uh, my favorite lines here that I think are very relevant. Uh, George Box has this line that says, essentially all models are wrong, but some are useful. I would add, this is also true for, the, for experiments, and what I'm thinking of is that wrong means inadequate here to address your particular question. So um, the other issue coming from uh, Albert Einstein's world is um, you would like everything to be made as simple as possible, but it should be simpler. So this is the issue of what is a minimum set of ingredients that you need to build into your code model to, um, to be successful in your prediction. And your prediction is essentially uh, an actual prediction or uh, addressing a question of interest, which could be many things. So in practice, uh, you start with some theory, you start with some modeling based on your theory, and you make hypotheses, and you have laboratory and computational observations that are gonna tell you if your hypothesis is appropriate or not. And you use uh, validation and uncertain quantification metrics to decide when your model uh, is successful. Now, the big challenge here is that the model in itself is limited because it's limited by your knowledge, it's limited by your ability to put your knowledge into some mathematical form, for example. And um, when you're actually doing observations, observations are uh, intimately linked to uh, initial and boundary conditions, and you can never know enough of them, and even if you know enough, the other challenge is how to model them. So this comes back to the final line here by Heisenberg, that uh, uh, in practice what you actually observe is nature exposed to your method of questioning. And here, concretely, your method of questioning is your modeling and your observations, and both have inherent limitations. So what we know from turbulence is, uh, uh, unfortunately, we still don't have a universal nice theory of, of turbulence that we'd like to rely on, but there's a bunch of things that we generally agree empirically on uh, as known. And um, so if you're, uh, usually, if the Reynolds number is high enough, at some point you have an inertial range, and uh, that usually happens above what's now called the mixing transition. and uh, this also is 
very closely connected to the fact that after a certain Reynolds number, which is very close to a mixing transition Reynolds number, your dissipation becomes not only finite, but also independent of Reynolds number. So these are the two major pieces that we tend to use in uh, simulations when we try to decide how to model uh, in computer uh, simulations uh, flow. And um, there's three approaches that we normally talk about. Um, and the, the point I want to try to make uh, is that all simulation models reduce something. And, uh, essentially, the, what you reduce is the range of scale that you can capture. So if you're doing DNS, you're focusing on the very small scale uh, physics, uh, for example, in a region, and the price you pay in doing that is that usually you take, for example, a cube or a nice periodic domain, and you focus there. And so the assumption is that you can do that independently of the large scale dynamics of the flow. If you're doing LES, then the assumption is that you can focus on the large scale behaviors and sort of model this part uh, in some hopefully universal fashion. And if you're doing RANS, uh, you typically think, okay, the only thing that matters, or, or rather the, what I'm going to focus on is the statistical behavior of the flow. And for example, predict uh, statistical quantities that I can actually get in, in laboratory measurements. So there's assumptions in all the simulation models. Uh, both DNS and LES presume scale separation, and RANS presumes typically that you have developed turbulence. So in, in, in a nutshell, there's no better method. There is the method that is appropriate and adequate for what you're trying to do. So what you do with LES is, um, going back to what I said, is there is an assumption the microphone must then be from the close. Sorry. Okay, so the bigger what is it too loud? Okay. Okay. Hope that works. So the big assumption in LES is that small scale dynamics is enslaved to that of the large scales. And um, there's a bunch of ways of doing this. Uh, historically, we've had a lot of classical, so-called classical methods that use, uh, uh, so you, have, you need to formulate a subway scale model. And there's functional forms, there's structural forms. And um, the, the Sago's book is probably the best uh, textbook on that. Um, implicit LES, which is the field I've been heavily involved in, uh, as, tries to focus on, on the numerics and what the numerics can implicitly do. And again, there's a couple of books, one that came out last year, I'll, I'll mention that again later. And, um, and, and the idea is that you have physics, build, appropriate physics built into the numerics. And there is a common framework to analyze because usually you have both of them mixed. And this is the modified equation analysis which focuses on uh, the, the equations satisfied by the actual computed solutions. So um, if you were to do modified equation analysis of a very simple system, and I'm focusing here on incompressible flows to keep it simple and just adding one coupling, uh, which is a scalar uh, equation here, then you have to deal normally with um, terms for closure of the filtered equations. And then you have uh, numerical terms here and computation error terms that have to do with the filtering, not commuting with derivatives, for example. And um, so in the best of worlds, you have incredibly good resolution. You don't worry about the, the, um, the numerical terms. And usually the commutation terms are lumped into the, the actual explicit methods. In practice, what's, what happens, and uh, Gosal has a very nice paper on that. Uh, actually, Hurt, Hurt uh, has an earlier paper, probably uh, 60 or 70s, in which he also addresses this explicitly. And the, the idea is that typically for the resolutions you use with LES, these terms turn to be comparable. So in practice, this has motivated people like Jay Boris to say, well, then why don't we just do it with the numerics? And uh, that has been the basis for IELTS, which works very well if you have 
higher in those numbers when st uh, almost every, every physics of interest um, is convection driven. Um, but in general, you need to have a, a mixture of explicit and implicit models. And uh, for example, if you have to address diffusive mix, if you have to address combustion, or if your Reynolds number is just uh, low. So uh, the important thing is that you need a framework, and the modified equation analysis gives you a framework to actually analyze this. So let me start first with the first subject I'm going to address, which is the subject of uh, scalar mixing. So scalar mixing is um, for high Reynolds number. So it's basically driven by large scale convection. That's the entrainment and steering part of the mixing, which um, is many times called uh, interpenetration. And, um, and for high Reynolds number, this is dominated, dominating the, the scalar mixing. If you have a lower Reynolds number, you're going to have to worry also about diffusive mixing. So again, my focus comes in complex systems, and uh, I suppose you're doing urban um, uh, transport, uh, uh, urban, uh, uh, the, the transport of a toxic substance of some sort in an urban environment. Um, typically, you have maybe 10, 20 cells across the street. Uh, you're not going to be able to do a very well resolved simulation between buildings. So um, the other extreme is, suppose this is a grid size and you want to make some model for what your volume fraction is inside for some material. Uh, there's many choices that you can make. And the, the question is, what kind of integral consequences of high Reynolds scanner mixing can you um, predict in some sensible simulation framework? And uh, this is where the two subjects I, was, I had in my first slide uh, are trying to focus on. Um, so um, first of all, I want to look at the problem of uh, scalar mixing. So the focus is looking at um, scalar with a mean uh, fixed gradient. And this is a problem that was, in, uh, I think it was introduced earlier by, uh, in the 90s by Steve Pope. Pulling had LES simulations uh, with the vortex stretch model uh, around 2000. There's been DNS uh, by Goto in 2012. And it's been a test problem that has been looked at by many people. And for us, we decided, uh, OK, uh, this might be a good problem to test uh, IELTS on and see how good or how bad it does on this problem. So the idea is uh, we did a compressible problem. Uh, we focus on Euler-based simulation. Uh, the momentum forcing has both a solenoidal and a dilatational component, and we can control uh, that through initial conditions. Um, the, the scalar has also a forcing, which we did a particular choice here, which is very close to what uh, Dale did on his own work earlier. And what we used here was a multidimensional 3D FCT, um, we used a forcing scheme by Peterson and Levesque, and we focused on low wave number forcing. And basically, there were two extremes. We chose a very low Mach number and a, a much higher num uh, Mach number, although still fairly low, 0.27 in terms of fluctuations. And our Schmidt number was 0.7, effective Schmidt number. So, um, um, so we did a. Uh, there was a student, Adam Wachter, that was working on his PhD thesis on this at uh, Irvine, and uh, we, we tried to do all the formal studies that we normally do in turbulence. We looked at spectra. We were able to see that the scalar spectra had this additional bump that the energy spectra didn't have, which is seen in the DNS also. And we tried to measure an effective Reynolds number associated to the grid resolution that would allow us to characterize the inertial range emulation that we were having. Uh, so basically, we're calculating an effective viscosity based on grid-resolved quantities, both velocities and derivatives. We can calculate a Taylor microscale also in, those, in terms of the usual definition the, with variances and gradients. And we can actually look at uh, an effective Reynolds number that we can calculate that way. Um, and um, these are the resolutions, these are the Reynolds numbers that we get. So we're just getting above the mixing transition for the two finer resolutions. And those are the two resolutions for which 
you can also see that there seems to be a, a, a nice suggestion of a, an inertial range for the energy spectra with a bump also that you're supposed to get also. So you can look at very detailed PDF analysis of various things. If you look at velocity and scalar, um, you get the expected Gaussian behaviors. If you look at uh, vorticity, and I'm comparing here with the DNS of Jimenez uh, for isotropic turbulence, uh, one of the things that you can see in, in those PDFs is that they tend to start piling up on each other above the mixing transition. And this is what you start seeing here as a function of gray resolution. So this concept of effective viscosity associated to effective resolution, to actual resolution is very meaningful in that respect. If you look at, so this involves transverse derivatives. If you look at in longitudinal derivatives, they're known to have certain biases. They're known that the tails are not Gaussian. And all these properties are captured both for the scalar and for the velocity uh, longitudinal derivatives. Uh, I'm not showing any here, but there's also analysis that you can do in terms of joint PDFs, and it also looks like the LES uh, results. So um, now I'm looking at the scalar variance, and uh, these are the results that Dale published in 2000. And one of the things that Dale showed at the time is that if he would turn his scalar model off, then he would get bad things. So one suggestion was, so what if you do IELTS in general? Is that what you get, or is it some numerical methods that do it and some do not? That was one of the motivations we, we did, wanted to do this problem. So you can get the constancy of the scalar variance um, as uh, the previous LES uh, showed above the mixing transition, and there is some sensitivity to the forcing, to how you actually force the isotropic turbulence and the choice of this normal and non-dimensional constant probably makes a difference also here. Could be one half instead of one. Um, but Dale's data had originally the one, so we, we stuck to that. So um, this was the real interesting part. We, we did this a little bit for completeness, and this is where we found interesting new results. So up to 2002, there was this uh, DNS by Pope that showed um, the ratio of the, Taylor, the two Taylor microscales from the scalar and from the, from the um, velocity um, seems to grow in uh, Pope's uh, DNS. Uh, Pauline was getting constancy after uh, going much beyond the Reynolds number that the DNS was available. And the DNS by Jung was able to show a consistent result at the time. So this is actually good for modelers because the conventional wisdom is as to assume that Taylor microscale for scalar and velocity will be similarly behaving for high Reynolds number and we are not going to need to expect any variation there. So um, if you look at the data that came after that, um, there's a 2006 theoretical analysis by Ristorcelli. 2012 DNS by Goto et al. And we did our IELTS around 2012. So we found that our IELTS was exactly on top of the DNS by Pope, to our surprise. We didn't expect we were gonna do that good. And then we also noticed that the trend seems to be consistent with both the theory and the DNS. So this continues growing, uh, I don't know up to what Reynolds number that we're seeing as a function of Reynolds number. To the best of our knowledge, people have not looked at. And it is an issue for modeling. And um, it, one suggestion here that we, we came up with is we were trying to understand why the IELTS was doing in some way a better uh, capturing of the expected results than classical results, uh, for example, by pooling, is that there might be real, realizability constraints built that are built into IELTS for some unknown reason we didn't by design do that, and um, might be necessary when you, uh, it's not just coming up with the right subway scale model, but how the subway scale model connects with the rest. And um, this brings the issue of what's the co-design that you're dealing with between theory and your computational paradigm, and that's the main thing I wanted to talk about here today. So when you're working with IELTS, you're, um, kind of mixing 
re theoretical results that you're building on the models and on the numerics. And um, you may or may not get a better result that way. This is, seems to suggest that choosing a, a very good co-design, and for us, very good means conservation equations, space averaging, time averaging, we found that this is crucial, and then having a non-oscillatory uh, numerical scheme that will ensure that you have positivity, for example, and you can capture shocks also. So it turns out that this is the kind of thing that seems to be behind the good um, capturing of the DNS results in the case of the ratio of Taylor microscales. So more fundamentally, the issue is what are we doing with IOS? It's not just a no model thing. It's uh, more, again, there's a number of physical features that are built into the co-design there. Um, one thing that we found uh, working with uh, Len Margarine and Bill Ryder at Los Alamos is, uh, is this issue that everything you observe involves finite scales. So this is probably what we should be dealing with, equations for physical observables. And we, we could have historically gone directly from kinetic theory to this. We have gone through a very strange path uh, historically on understanding IELTS, which is um, integrating kinetic theory, going to continuum Navier-Stokes equations, then when we happen to be solving, like we did here with non-oscillatory methods, uh, these equations, we found that we can get these results. And this is, um, uh, I, can't, I don't have time to get into this, but uh, this is the work that uh, Margoling and Ryder did um, in, in published papers. So, uh, so basically the idea is, what they showed is that so-called truncation error terms are not really truncation errors in the sense there are corrections when you're trying to see the difference between your finite scale equations and your continuum equation. It's the additional source terms that you need to get the equations for the finite scale uh, observables. That's basically the, the bottom line. So um, um, I don't have time, like I said, to get into um, details, but there's a book that came out last year, and the first part of the book has um, worked by, uh, so this is the part I talked about earlier in scalar mixing. There's a chapter by Yi Zhao talking about his minimum model for turbulence, and it's very relevant here. There's a chapter by Len Margolin discussing all these finite scale Navier-Stokes equations, and Risto Celli trying to see how you formalize turbulence uh, analysis to understand um, the goods and the bads of vials and finite scale Navier-Stokes. So um, I'll refer you to, to the book um, for more details and hope you will be motivated. So the other problem is the problem of, of shock-driven turbulence mixing. And um, so uh, we went through the issue of um, we have a finite, finite resolution grid, so we need a subway scale model. And this is essentially the same problem that people have in experiments. They have instrumentation with finite size. And um, like, likewise, you have initial conditions, you have a, a domain which is finite, so you need to introduce initial and boundary conditions. So in other words, this is really a textbook issue. Um, if you want a unique, well-posed solution, you have to provide all the additional things. So you need to provide the subway scale information, you need to provide the initial and boundary condition, condition information. So when you're doing transitional flows, like this is the the shock-driven turbulence problem is one of them, um, you have to deal with initial conditions. So typically, you, you care about these problems, for example, for applications like um, uh, ICF, uh, capsule implosion problems, and the idea is that you would like to be able to understand um, the effect of having initial conditions here at the initial interfaces um, and how they, they, you can control the late time effects for example, in the case of the capsule, um, uh, how well or how bad you were able to concentrate um, this volume, small volume there, so that you have, uh, you're closer to having actual uh, fusion there. So um, there's a bunch of problems that you do, um, test problems. We have been looking at the ICF capsule implosion problems in our context, these are simulations that uh, 
were mainly Brian Haynes that uh, made them. It's the Omega experiments. And uh, this is very close to the state of the art. It was a few years ago. And, uh, and basically, it's this game of starting with initial conditions and having the right numerics and the right co-designed um, uh, computational paradigm. And, uh, and I'll get back to this towards the end. I'm trying to, to wrap up this. Um, so um, IELTS has been very effective in doing uh, this shock-driven turbulence problems because essentially it gives a way of emulating both the turbulence and the shocks. And uh, ourselves at, La at Los Alamos, we have been uh, trying a number of different configurations leading to the ICF capsule problem. And um, I'm going to give you a, a, a quick summary of some of the issues. One issue that we found was the issue of um, uh, you start with a bunch of different initial conditions here. Uh, you try to put different, uh, so there's an egg crate, which has a lambda knot characteristic uh, wavelength. And on top of that, you have uh, the ability of uh, adding noise, which is there in the experiment, but you never know with accuracy what exactly it is in the experiment, what is superimposed to this um, membrane pressed with a grid that imposes this egg crate structure. So you can try different ranges of uh, wavelengths, and uh, Dale Pooling has done himself uh, simulations like this. When we started ours, we were trying to compare with him first. And um, so this is the vetter sturivan experiment at Caltech, and uh, this is a case in which you are able to get the growth rates. The big challenge is what happens um, for late time, where depending on the assumptions, especially on the long wavelength assumption of um, that random noise superimposed to the egg crate, you can get very different results. So one issue there is um, uh, the predictability issue. How good can you expect to, to go um, in this process of uh, in this career that you're trying to build around shock-driven turbulence simulations? So one of the things we found looking at uh, uh, ways of prescribing initial conditions, we focus on the morphology at one stage. And this is basically um, a measure of the, the characteristics of the initial condition here in terms of the amplitude and the characteristic wavelength. That's what the eta naught is. So we found that for small eta naughts, which is when the initial interface is fairly thin, you get the traditional rich my meshkov and when this is big, uh, not surprising from what I'm going to say later, um, you can get very different behaviors. Like, for example, your mix width increases or decreases depending on the actual et eta naught. And we call this the bipolar behavior of rich my mesh cuff. Um, and there's two properties associated. In this case, it's just ballistic growth, and it's what you would find as a linear growth here. In this other case, you have nonlinear mode coupling, and um, it's actually not rich my mesh, but we would argue it's a combination of a number of instabilities. So um, we tried this on this very complex problem of a shock gas curtain. This is one problem that we were doing in parallel at the time with a planar uh, rich my mesh cuff. And um, we found that um, um, instead of the eta naught, we defined a structure characteristic parameter here that characterizes the gas curtain cross-section. And in this limit, we had the, the, the corresponding thing to the low eta naught, and we found the linear growth, and otherwise we found the nonlinear growth. So um, this is interface, initial interface morphology seems to be a big issue that we need to be able to characterize in our problems. Um, the issue is that if you really want to look at it uh, as a function of eta naught, and you look at it in terms of the vortex generation mechanisms that are allowed for each case, um, if this is very thin, you have your traditional rich my mesh cuff. It's if, if it's thick, for example, you can see here you would have a kelvin helmholtz uh, instability that could be acting because velocities, transport velocity is going to be different within uh, the different materials. So there's rich my mesh cuff is just one of the baroclinic instabilities uh, that are possible. And the issue is that when you have a complex initial condition here, really the issue is the 
initial balance between the various possible instabilities depending on the initial conditions that you're imposing. And this is the typical thing that you have, for example, at reshock conditions. Um, and and uh, so the issue is how do you characterize this in your simulations? So we envision that we need to have some kind of useful, complete uh, description of the initial conditions for predictability. Uh, some kind of ensemble averaging over the relevant initial condition variability might be necessary. Um, this is uh, hybrid RANS LES might have a role here because RANS in itself involves some kind of averaging already. Um, so um, there's a bunch of questions here as possible directions that we could look at. Uh, machine learning to formulate and to, to learn the initial conditions might be a way to go and proper orthogonal decomposition, not surprisingly, has come as one of the possibilities. So this was the outline. Um, let me just go through, uh, I have three quick uh, slides to wrap up. Um, I, 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 like, I love to say this every time I can, subgrid scale modeling is primarily empirical activity within a pragmatic practice. And the reason for this is that we don't have a nice universal theory of turbulence. So this is what the problem we have and whether we like it or not. Um, most of the subject scale models are designed to be dissipative because this general uh, assumption of coarse grain simulation seems to be what we see most of the time in the experiments. In practice, you have non-dissipative physics, uh, backscatter, for example. The hope is that for sufficiently high Reynolds number, uh, they're presumably less important. This is, again, for each question of interest, you have to address that. And coarse grain simulation might not work for that case. So I want to try to focus on that. It's not IELTS versus LES. It's whether LES is appropriate tool for what you're trying to do. If you have backscatter, LES, as usually practitioned, this might not be the, the right thing to do. There are many uncharacterized variable density processes that need to be looked at. Uh, material interface dynamics, there's not a sound mathematical formalism here that we can rely on. Uh, VOF is probably the best that we have right now, but uh, still has a lot of issues. Effect of material interface fluctuations. So the issue here is characterizing them and then finding out how to model them in your actual simulation code. Um, interacting shocks, sharp material interface and turbulence, there's a lot of open issues there. Uh, various mechanisms for bioclinic production beyond what typically we look at in Rich Murray Meshkov and Raleigh Taylor. Um, and then if you have exothermicity due to either chemical or thermonuclear reaction, there's a lot of unknowns there. Um, so we noted a, one, one interesting thing that I thought we noted here is this issue of uh, do we have an appropriately co-designed theory and algorithm paradigm. I think we normally have not looked at these things very much. We kind of found it a little bit by accident. Um, I think it's a big issue. It's, uh, um, most, if you're doing DNS, you have all the resolution you want, and you're doing really what DLNS should be, which is resolving all the necessary scales in space and time, which we never really do, then it's, all these things are not issues. Technically, you're, you're, whatever you're doing is independent of the numerical scheme and the grid and so forth. But ideally, that's not what you do in practice. In practice, you have complex systems and you have under-resolved conditions. So um, you need to address this. You're gonna be able to do some with the algorithm and some with your actual numerical model, your simulation model. Um, so modified equation analysis is really the right way to either assess or to reverse engineer the co-design subgrid scale physics. And in addition to um, um, things we talked about, which is, uh, there's, uh, I vaguely touched a little bit this, the issue of continuum versus discrete formulation. This is an issue in itself. The issue of you have to mix explicit and implicit subway scale models. Um, there's a new field coming now, which is gonna be data science driven um, research, for example, with machine learning. This is gonna to have to be incorporated, there's new architectures, new software paradigms, new ways of computing stuff. And I would say that overall, 
you have to deal with the interaction of all these pieces. We have been looking at this part in this talk. Uh, you, you start from theory, you're gonna do some theoretical approximation. It's gonna interact with the numerics. We talked a little bit about this. More generally, you have a software implementation, you have a hardware capability, all these pieces are interconnected. And um, anybody that has been involved with the new computing architectures knows that most of the time you don't repeat results just because you didn't get the same number of processors or the same distribution of processors. So yeah, we're gonna have to find a way of factoring all this. And then there's the issue of big data science, which definitely is gonna be affecting the ultimate theoretical approximation. This is another talk. So let me stop there. <laughs>